All right, welcome everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about rodents more. This is the second week, so we have even more to cover. Um, as a bit of a reminder, last week we talked about sciuromorphic species. So in the top right, you see where there's that big kind of solid plate as you look head on at the skulls. This week, we're going to talk about myomorphic, bottom left, and hystricomorphic, bottom right. So let's start by talking about hystricomorphic. Now, the infraorbital foramen, that's the hole that you see a big circle in the bottom right, kind of a narrower um, triangular kind of shape in the bottom left. It's enormous for hystricomorphic um, species. <laughs> and it's that big because there's this large jaw muscle that is passing through that hole. So when we talk about hystricomorphic um, species, that word comes from hystricidae, which is the family of old world porcupines. So these are porcupines found in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Really, I mean, really striking looking quills, I think a lot cooler than our native porcupine. But all of these porcupine are in one family, completely separate from the family that we have here. And while there is some, you know, common ancestry relative to a lot of other um, rodents, actually the development of quills is completely independent convergent evolution of our new world porcupines and the old world porcupines. So they're not directly related. In the, on the left, um, Erythizon dorsatum is the new North American porcupine. This is the one that we need to know for class. This is the one that is found in Montana and across, well, a lot of North America. But there are 18 other species of New World porcupine that are not found in the United States. And those are all found in tropical Central and South America. A lot of them um, spend most of their time in trees and have prehensile tails and are a bit different than the um, larger, stouter porcupine that you think of here in the US. So there are a lot of other hystricomorphic rodents, mostly in South America. So we have the porcupines in the old world. We have our porcupine is pretty much the only hystricomorph to um, make its way into temperate North America. But we have all these other species that are found in South America through Central America. And you may be familiar with some of them. On the left, we have the Nutria or Koipu, which is native to South America, but has been introduced to North America and is an invasive species across a lot of the country. There have been Nutria in Montana, but they have not established a, um, a viable population. So we don't have to worry about it for now, but um, <laughs> across a lot of the rest of the country, they are a problem. In the cavey family, keep being in mind, these are all hystricomorphs, so they all have those giant holes in their skulls. The capybara on the top left is the world's largest rodent. It's about the size of a sheep. And in the same family, but a lot smaller, are guinea pigs, which you probably have heard of. Um, <clears throat> South American history, well, biogeography and paleo history is really fascinating. A lot of rodents kind of fill niches of other species. So on the top two, capybara and the mara, those two are grazers that, in a sense, kind of filled niches of what we have ungulates here in North America doing. And then later ungulates made their way to South America, but that's a different story. And then other species we have include the agouti and the paca, which are important seed dispersers and relatively large compared to um, what we think of as typical rodent size. 
and the chinchilla, which you may have heard of as a pet, is native to um, the mountains of South America. It is also a hystricomorph. It's part of this whole South American rodent group. Viscacha, I think, look really cool. I'm also very interested in this tuco tuco, tuco tuco in the bottom right, because it looks and acts like a pocket gopher, but it is completely unrelated. And that's something that I mentioned next week too, is just there are several examples of rodents um, adapting for a fossorial or digging underground lifestyle. All right, so now that we've talked about hystricomorphic, let's talk about myomorphic species. So like hystricomorphic, in the myomorphic condition or whatever you want to call it, there's a muscle passing through that hole, but it's differently shaped in this case, and that hole is called the infraorbital foramen, in case that comes up in your key. So there are a bunch of different families we're going to talk about that are all myomorphic. First family I'm gonna mention is Dipodidae, which are the jerboas and jumping mice. So the top two species we have here, the western jumping mouse and the meadow jumping mouse, are both found in Montana. We're just gonna learn the western jumping mouse though because um, they're difficult to tell apart. And so for the species that we have in the US, these jumping mice, they have relatively long feet, very long tails, they hop around, but otherwise they look rather mouse-like. However, if you look at the jerboas, which are native to um, Asia and Africa, you see something very different. You see like sandy coloration, larger bodies, very long tail, huge feet hopping around all over the place. <laughs> and that may look familiar because you might be thinking of kangaroo rats, which we have here in the United States which are sandy colored, have a long tail, um, really big feet hopping around, living in deserts. This is an example of convergent evolution. Here, these jerboas are adapted for living in the deserts of African Asia. Here, um, our kangaroo rats are adapted for living in the deserts of North America, but they evolved separately. Um, Besides the kangaroo rats, we have a few other species, the pocket mice on the right side. Of these, we're only learning the um, olive-backed pocket mouse, Peregnathus fasciatus. So on this slide, Heteromidae, we need to know Peregnathus fasciatus, and then uh, Dipotomys ordi is the Ords kangaroo rat found in eastern Montana. There are other species of kangaroo rats found in the Southwest. The giant kangaroo rat is found in California and is the largest of them, um, but we don't need to know other kangaroo rats, just Dipotomies forty. So something to know for these heteromyids, different than other species that we'll talk about today, is they have external cheek pouches. So, you can see in the bottom left that giant kangaroo rat has these pouches of skin outside of its mouth and in those pockets it has stuffed seeds. This is why the pocket mice are called pocket mice because they have those external cheek pouches and when you look at them that should be what you look at to know aha this is heteromidae and not some other mouse that we'll mention later. These dipodids um, don't have those cheek pouches. One last thing to mention on this slide is kangaroo rats are super awesome because they are masters at escaping um, rattlesnakes. And I don't really have the chance to share it right now, but if you just look for ninja rat videos, so that is ninja rat, you can see these incredible videos of kangaroo rats jumping out of the way of rattlesnakes that are striking them. So it's like super like slow motion of this instantaneous just uh, <laughs> rattlesnake attacking and then kangaroo rat just flipping completely out of the way. Look it up, ninja rat, it's great. So we've talked about Dipodidae and Heteromidae. Now let's talk about Muridae. This is a huge family. 
So these are the old world uh, rats and mice. Um, 730 species, very big group. These are just some of the really interesting ones that I've stumbled across. So they're all across Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. There are some native um, mice and rat species to Australia, including the water rat, so the kind of center left. That aquatic rat right there is native to Australia. There are also things like spiny mice, which um, have kind of coarse hair. Um, and gerbils are mice, but fancy mice for pets. What you're probably most familiar with in this family though, are the brown rat and the house mouse. And these are two that we are going to learn for this class. So the brown rat, also called common rat, also called Norway rat, the scientific name is Rattus norvegicus, but it's not necessarily from Norway. People just thought at one point it was. These two species have spread all over the world. So these maps show their current distribution and these did not exist in the Western Hemisphere before they were brought by humans, but where humans gone, they have followed, especially the rat. So we'll talk about in the other video how to identify um, these rats, mice versus our native North American um, rats and mice, which are in this family, Chrysetidae. This is another very big group. So here, Muridae, 730 species. Here, 681 species. That's probably approximate because people lump and split species all the time, but it's a very big group. And there's a lot of variety. And we'll talk about this next week because there are so many species. But this week, we'll just talk about this subset right here. So these are the ones of Chrysetidae that look and act like mice and rats, rather than hamsters or muskrat or voles or anything else. So these are the five species of new world mice and rats that we have in Montana. Um, we have the bushy-tailed wood rat, also called the pack rat. We have deer mouse, um, western harvest mouse, white-footed mouse, northern grasshopper mouse. The white-footed mouse is very similar to the deer mouse, and we're not going to identify the white-footed mouse because it's too similar. Deer mouse found all over the place. In the US, it's found from coast to coast. It's found from Death Valley up to the peaks of mountains in the Rockies. It's found just all over the place. Um, the northern grasshopper mouse is probably my favorite rodent um, because this is the most carnivorous rodent that we have in, well, in Montana, in the United States. There are a few species of grasshopper mouse. Grasshopper mice are called that because they eat things like grasshoppers and things like scorpions. They're immune to scorpion poison so that when scorpions are stinging them, <laughs> they're totally fine. Um, they stalk their prey like a cat and then they attack it and have been known to eat all sorts of arthropods and invertebrates, also other mice. And grasshopper mice howl to mark their territory. So you can see little videos of them standing on their back, back feet and letting out this little eep. And that is these terrifying carnivorous mice howling. Just awesome. All right, so that covers all of the species. There is one more thing that I wanna talk about because this is very difficult to show in the like videos where I'm in front of the whiteboard and it's something that I hope is clear in the photos, but takes some explanation. And this is new world mice versus old world mice teeth. So when I say new world mice, I'm talking about the deer mouse, harvest mouse, and grasshopper mouse because the wood rat has different types of teeth. And for the old world, that I'm talking about these. So I'm talking about these two species versus the species except 
the pack rat here. Pack rat is very different, should be obvious. But these ones all have kind of bumps on the teeth. They have three um, upper and lower um, cheek teeth. How do you tell them apart? Well, on the left, we see two rows of bumps. The key describes them as tubercles or cusps or whatever. But think about how on your teeth, you have these little bumps. And in the New World mice and rats, they're arranged on either side. So you see kind of bumps on the cheek side and bumps on the tongue side, and then this kind of valley down the center of the tooth. Versus the Old World mice and rats, you see three rows of bumps. So you see kind of a little bump on the outside, a bump in the center, and a bump on the inside. You may or may not see the three rows really clearly. What I think might be an even better way to describe this than how the key says is in the New World mice on the left, there's this valley going down the center of the tooth, kind of from top to bottom all the way through. Versus on the Old World mice, there are bumps. So if you get a good view of the teeth, it should be pretty obvious once you know what you're looking for. So with that then, just to review, we don't have as many species this week, but we have a lot of different families. So in Erythizon today, the New World porcupine family, we have Erythizon dorsatum, our North American porcupine. Heteromyidae, we have the pocket mouse, Peregnathus fasciatus, and um, the kangaroo rat, Dipotomys oridae. In Uridae, the old world mice and rats, we have our brown rat, common rat, et cetera, and our house mouse. Dipotidae, um, we have our jumping mouse, Zapdos princeps. And then in Crisetidae, there will be a lot more Crisetidae next week, but this week, just to start out with, the ones that look mouse like are Neotoma cinera, Hermiscus maniculatus, Onychomys leucogaster, and Rhythodonomys megalotus. Now, before I end this video, I'm going to mention one thing that I did mention in the video in front of the uh, whiteboard, but I'm going to say again because this is a really clear picture, which is to say a difference between Muridae and the other species we have up here is that in Muridae, um, the mice and rats don't have strong counter shading. That is, the back and the belly are similar colors. But if you look at the other species we have here, you can see white or off-white bellies with kind of a striking line between the back color and the belly color. So looking even at Perignathus fasciatus, you can see kind of a line of the white from the underneath. So if it looks mouse-like and it doesn't have that kind of strong differentiation, then that is probably a house mouse.